A Glance in the Mirror by Terence Keary A story of two families, a boy, and a man with two wives. Chapter 1 A World Away I see a bronzed lined face and a couple of blue eyes looking back at me. I'm not sure whether the look is worried or inquiring. The stony stare, suggesting uncertainty, looks past me over my left shoulder at something in the distance. Although the lips are tightly compressed, they're not firm but show concern as if the future unclear. Thankfully the past is a whole lot sharper, able to be recalled in some detail. The mirror also reflects a night scene behind the face of a town, street and house. The leaves on the garden trees and the blossoms on the bough can just be made out. It's a warm summer night in mid-July. The year is 1935 and all is quiet. The curtains hanging in the front bedroom are drawn for privacy rather than left open for the cool night air to circulate. A dull light from an overhead fixture casts the shadows of two men and a woman onto the bed where a mother lies cuddling a baby. The baby has just been born and given the name of Terence. The husband bustles about, returning downstairs for more hot water under the watchful eyes of the midwife. The doctor, pleased with the night's work, looks on at the baby who is nestling close to its mother. Although the room has little furniture, and what there is is not of the best, it is a happy place, and everyone displays in their own way pride, contentment and goodwill towards the new infant. The child's parents, Albert bent on fetching the water, and Elsie, the proud mother, were married two years before in Tatworth, a village in Somerset that gave its finest to the lace mill and later the butter factory. The newly wed couple celebrated their wedding with the whole family around them, Albert proud to have courted a beautiful young woman seventeen years his junior, and Elsie equally proud having married an established man about town with a secure job. The bedroom scene takes place in one of three bedrooms belonging to a semi-detached house located in one of London's garden towns. This description was a sales clerk's romantic turn of phrase plucked from an enthusiastic property developer's brochure. It was meant to tempt workers out from the centre of London to the suburbs. The happy event is the prelude to carefree days shared with the child's elder brother, Stanley. During the two years the family had settled in, making their home a haven of peace and contentment, and every day the mother goes through her same routine, to welcome the father back home from work at six. She stands at the kitchen door, tea towel in hand. The father has just walked to the house from the station, opened the door and moved into the hall, then kitchen. He kisses his wife. Hello, dear. He sits down at the table after parking his leather briefcase next to the dresser. How's your day been? Elsie, having warmed his dinner through, places it before him. Fine. The boys have been playing in the garden. Outside, the lawn and trees, boxed in by the privet hedge, provide a familiar backdrop. It's nothing special, for it's a home of simple pleasures, perfect for such an undemanding couple. The father's sons, Stanley and Terence, are playing with their lead shoulders at the bottom of the garden. As the father sits eating his evening meal, his eyes take in the familiar scene. He lets out a contented sigh, casting his thoughts back to his grandfather's home in Ireland, to the hardships and sacrifices he had made. The family originally hailed from the central southern counties just below Loch Derg in North Tipperary. Many Irish clans lost their place on the map over their fight to live as they chose. Families split, given harbour or moved away. The reasons as much to do with family allegiances as to absenteeism. 
Many who dwelt away from the coast and rivers up in the hills and inaccessible places retained their ancient traditions, their names and their burial places. Through the ages many old Irish families lost their land by seizure, battles and plantation. The ruling families wanted the inhabitants to conform to their ways, which caused unrest. This provoked the Anglo-Irish to drive those who wished to retain the old ways off their land. To obtain work and the right to own property, the Gaelic-Irish had to assume Englishness in name and habit, and many of the clan, O'Kiri, adopted the Latinized form Kiri or Kerry, or some such variant, to integrate with the usurpers. Others chose to immigrate to the colonies or seek work in England. In the Mount Joy ward of County Dublin, north, lays the parish of St Thomas. Just off King's Street, north, is King's Keary's Lane, not far from St Paul's Church. James Keary and his wife Mary, Ryan, brought up their children as strict Anglicans, attending the Church of Ireland's St. Paul's Church in Dublin. Their first-born child was named Thomas, as was the custom. Being regular church-goers, they had him baptised that same year, on the 4th of December, 1791. Thomas trained as a worker in metal, following his father's trade and when he was twenty-five he decided to seek his fortune in England, adding EY to his name. And this was to help integrate him into his new society. King Street is not far away from the river and is renowned for the Dublin Easter Rising and the Barricades in 1916, where where King Street massacre occurred. Our story picks up the trail from Central Ireland to a ferry in Dublin. Thomas Keary arrived at the Liverpool dockside in 1816. With his bag of tools over his shoulder, he was ready to start a new life. When he marched down the gangplank, he was excited by the challenges which lay ahead. He sought passage to London by coach, relying on his skills as a worker in metal to find work, and perhaps start a business, for Dublin silversmiths and goldsmiths were recognised as highly skilled craftsmen. These skills, working with precious metals, carried over to working with tin and lead, metals more closely allied to the home, servicing water tanks, pipes, buckets, cauldrons, washing facilities and cooking pots and all other metal containers. Not only was he skilful shaping metal but also had knowledge of joinery and the manufacture of carts. Thomas described himself as a goldsmith which today may be better described as a tinsmith and as a smelter, an extractor of metal from an ore. Later, these skills became more associated with plumbing, necessary for the new water and waste systems. The O'Keary clan originally occupied the hills and lowlands of the east side of Loch Derg. The ore washed down from those hills would have been a silt of any number of metals. It wouldn't be surprised to find local people adept at smelting that oil, or and either coating hammered out sheets of metal with tin or combining tin and copper to make bronze or smelting lead and tin to make pewter. The smelter of one ore would be knowledgeable enough to work with any number of base or, or precious metals. Tinware were pr- produced in London in the early 1600s, producers becoming incorporated by 1670. The skills of a whitesmith were more concerned with cutting, shaping and hammering out sheet metal, making joints and seams, using a mixture of lead and tin to make solder to give a watertight joint. Thomas may have worked in silver, 
making jewellery. However, when working in London, it was highly unlikely that Thomas would be working with this expensive metal. He would have been devoting all his energies to working with lead and tin in a household environment, making and repairing pipes and cooking pans, pots and utensils for a working population. He was quite prepared to seek work of a more mundane kind, to start afresh, hopefully with better prospects for long-term employment, especially after taking the plunge to leave home. His family, having travelled through years of persecution, exploitation and finally eviction, now had to split up and find their own way, away from the country they loved. When the Irish immigrant travelled to London, he made for Soho, Westminster. It was here that he felt most at home. The Irish populated Soho and the surrounding streets and alleyways. There are many written accounts about St. Giles in the field, St. Anne's, Dean Street, in the early 1800s, appearing as a maze of cellars and tenements based on the boundaries of St. Giles High Street, Bainbridge Street and Doit Street. This was about the time that gas lighting first started to be installed in London, initially in Pall Mall. Within the area about St. Giles, New Oxford Street was developed to lay waste to the slums of Church Lane, Maynard Street, Carrier Street, Ivy Lane and Church Street, which was a mass of courts, alleyways and hiding places. These countless tenements were described as rookeries, or perhaps as Little Dublin, or the Holy Land, and they were populated mainly by the Irish. The area of Westminster, Tot Hill Street, York Street and Castle Lane were localities given one or other of the deriding terms and they were connecting Oxford Street and Hoban, the area of the abandoned of both sexes. The whole area was sold for redevelopment by private contract in 1844. Even today's congested streets and heavy traffic doesn't suitably depict the area of that time. The noise, the horses, shouts, cries of the passing traders, street urchins darting here and there, the sandwich board men, the dust, the dirt, the droppings, puddles and stench, all underfoot. The omnibuses disgorged to passengers Ponderous wagons turned down narrow lanes, completely blocking them, forcing all to burst out into the streets at the other end. It was described as a howling wilderness. To Thomas, Georgian London must have seemed intimidating. He was here to escape poverty, but was faced with it. Peace and space deigned both. He, his bag of tools, at one time a mark of the end of tray, here the bag felt like a burglar's hall. However, it wasn't any good berating his bad luck, he just had to make a go of it. He wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Now he had adopted an English spelling for his name, he couldn't face the scorn of the rest of the family by going back. He just had to go forward. And it was in Westminster that Thomas met Esther Pepler, shortly after taking lodgings, in 1818. Immediately they were attracted, meeting every day. Thomas courted Esther and visited her parents in Stanmore, Middlesex. She was born and christened in 1794 in Great Stanmore, a small village on the outskirts of North London, just off the Great North Road. Esther's mother, before marriage, was named Mary Collins, having the same paternal surname as the baby's mother. Within the year, Thomas married Esther on the 17th of October, 1819, at St. Anne's Church, Soho, calling himself a baggage porter, goldsmith and goldsmelter. During their marriage, lasting 60 years, Thomas fathered two boys and five girls. 
his wife, died in March 1872 in Westminster at the age of 79 and was buried in the same church they were married in. In 1816, the building of the Grand Junction Branch Canal was being dug out on the Paddington Estate. At the same time, houses were being built along its banks to furnish the builders with homes. In 1801, there were only 324 houses in Paddington. This was a time of expansion in keeping with the canals and the development of steam engines. Connell Place in 1807 was the start of the development of Tyburnia between Edgware Road and the Uxbridge Road. A couple of years later, the degradation caused concern. It wasn't before time. By then, Paddington had 879 inhabited houses to give shelter to 4,609 persons. It wasn't long before Paddington acquired a terrible reputation. The area on the north side of Paddington and Maribyrn Estates was as far as the more reasonable living conditions went, for beyond lay mean streets, alleyways, huts, reservoirs, wharves and warehouses. The building of the Great Western Railway reinforced this diversion in the 1830s with its terminus and goods station. The land between the railway and canal, intersected by Harrow Road, had deteriorated into slums and a large percentage of those were displaced, filled with displaced Irishmen. This whole area began to be redeveloped. The people were gradually pushed out whole estates raised to the ground and the builders moved in. It became a period of massive building projects that made the way for the prosperous suburbs of Bayswater, Paddington and Kensington, where rich traders, people of developers, merchants and professional men followed the gentry into taking over the new houses, giving a further boost to the area with their lavish lifestyles. Westbourne became the place to be, reaching to the southernmost end of Westbourne Green. And by 1860 the feverish pitch of building started to fall off. Thomas and Esther's eldest son born in 1820 in St Giles, Middlesex, was named Thomas, in keeping with family custom. He was trained after leaving school as a whitesmith and tinsmith, taking over much of the trade from his father. He married Hannah Raybold when she was 21, at St Andrew by the Wardrobe, Hoban, in 1841. Her father, Henry, was also a whitesmith, installing cauldrons for wash houses and laundries. It was thought at the time there were 1,000 Irish paupers entering London each week, congregating around this area, and they were all seeking work. The railway age started in 1825, when Thomas was five. By the start of the First World War, almost every part of the country was covered by the railway. It was unusual for anyone to work in a factory that employed more than ten people, for this was the average staff content of most stately homes, and people were just not used to, to controlling more. It seemed strange that businesses had this almost mental limit for group practices. The railways broke this barrier, Becoming, becoming the major employer. Thomas's brother William, 1837 to 1902, was the sixth child of Thomas and Esther, and he was born the same year Queen Victoria came to the throne. He became a much respected Westminster City Councillor for 14 years. About the same time, the London County Council was established. He was a coal merchant, baker and boot merchant, 
which complimented his wife's father, who was a leather dealer. During his two marriages, he had fifteen children. Four of the births were recorded in St. Anne's Church, Soho. The St. Anne's Church was the same church his brother Thomas was married in, eighteen years before. Nine of William's children had connections with the borough of Brompton, where they were all born. And there's a plaque erected in Westminster City Hall to his honour for his loyal and faithful work to the people of Westminster, particularly the poor. At the turn of the century, Kilkiri Parish, Tipperary, was recorded as being situated in Upper Ormond, four miles southwest of Nina. The land within its boundaries held 2,524 acres, containing 662 inhabitants. It lay 27 miles from Limerick, in County Tipperary, in the Diocese of Killaloe. Sufficient capital was provided the large parish with a private school capable of providing education for 70 local children. The farmland alone bought in tithes amounting to £120, which went towards the rector's type end. The growing strength of the British economy had an effect not only on Irish manufacturing, but also in siphoning off capital from Ireland's farming community. Thomas's move away from Ireland was precipitant, for when his son William was eight years old, the people of Kilkiri were locked in famine conditions. Gradually, the eldest boy of poor families moved into the cities, thereafter making their way to Dublin and onwards to England and London. It was a desperate situation, alleviated by the new industrial society, its quest for power and the need for swifter transportation, accomplished by construction of better roads, the birth of canal navigation, and the manufacture of bricks and steel. The invention of steam locomotion and the construction of the railway network added to the demand for yet more coal and once this movement was afoot, society gravitated from a rural existence to town and city life. This movement of people went with the invention of machines to mass-produce everyday products, each feeding upon the other. Now there was no stopping the need to continue the process. Fortunately, there was sufficient labour available. <laughs>